So, it's the topic we've been trying to avoid all this time. Let's talk about friction. It's pretty much inescapable. Let's see where it comes from. So, to get a sense of where it comes from, if you want to get a little bit of space on the work place where you're working right now, whether it's your desk or uh, maybe it's a cover of a book or something like that, just run your fingers along that surface, and I would have you do this in classroom along the surface of your desk, and describe how that feels. Hopefully you said it feels kind of smooth, right? Most workspaces are kind of smooth. Uh, well, it turns out it's not smooth. At a microscopic level, if you would take a very high-powered microscope to the surface of your desk or whatever it is you're working on, it would look something like this. It would be very, very jagged, all sorts of irregularities. And anything touching your desk, whether it's your uh, calculator or your notebook or your elbow leaning against your desk, if you were to take a high-powered microscope to it as well, it would also be a very jagged surface, very uh, irregular, all sorts of extra atoms here and there. Really, any surface magnified looks like this. And this could be because of the dust settling on your desk, or it could be skin cells that you knock off your hand when you're scraping your hand, or every single time you hit your desk, you're actually knocking billions and billions of atoms off of it, creating huge, huge valleys there on the microscopic level. And this is where the friction comes from. You can see sometimes the peaks and the valleys, they sort of fit into each other. They lock into each other. And if you were to try to scrape one surface past the other, well, this is where the friction comes from. It resists that. And even when they don't lock into each other, every time there's a point of contact between the surfaces, the atoms of one surface bond to the atoms of the other with almost like an atomic glue. And to scrape one surface past the other, you have to break those bonds. It requires effort on your part. And again, this is where the friction comes from. So now that we have a sense of what that all looks like, well, now let's try to visualize trying to move one object past another. So let's say, for example, you're at your friend's house watching movies or something like that, and your friend's mom comes in and says, you know what, I don't like how the uh, furniture is arranged in this room. I need to move this couch all the way to the other side of the room so you and your buddy now have to move your couch. So I want you to visualize that. Right? So there's you and the couch. And let's try to figure out uh, what might affect how much friction there is on the couch. So what might increase the friction? So you might say, well, maybe the surfaces uh, would affect it, right? So let's say if you're on like a sort of smooth wood surface versus a rough carpet, well, then, of course, there'd be more friction, more irregularities on the rough carpet than there is on the smooth surface of the wood. What else might increase the amount of friction? Well, if your buddy gets kind of lazy and decides to lay down on the couch, it's not that there's extra mass to the couch, not that there's extra weight to the couch, but in doing so, the couch is now pressing more against the floor, against the surface, which means that these surfaces are going to lock into each other even more. And so it's about the amount of one surface pressing into the other, and of course we have a name for that, that's called normal force. So the larger the normal force, the more the surfaces press against each other, the more friction there will be between the surfaces. So we'll say in general, the amount of friction depends on the properties of the surfaces, that's the roughness of them, and on the normal force, how much they're pressing against each other. Which way does the friction force point? Well, it actually points to oppose relative motion. Some students get a little confused and think that it has to oppose another force. And while certainly that's going to happen a lot of the time, that's not necessarily the case. If you push an object and let it go, you're not pushing anymore, so there's no force in that direction of motion, but there'll still be a friction force opposing the relative motion between the surfaces. Now, friction will act while the object is in motion, but sometimes friction will also act to keep an object in place, which means that there are two types of friction, static friction and kinetic friction. You've probably seen words like this before. Static refers to object at rest with respect to the surface. It has the same root as stationary, S-T-A-T. -T. And of course, I'm sure you know that kinetic means moving with respect to the surface. Let's tackle the static friction first. So let's go back to that idea of the couch. All right, so there's the couch, and there's you pondering moving the couch. You're not moving the couch yet. And you have not touched the couch. You're not applying a force to the couch. So how much friction should there be on the couch? Well, hopefully you realize if you're not touching the couch, you're not even trying to move the couch, that the force of friction on the couch should be zero. Right? Because if it weren't, that would mean that there would be a force of friction on the couch, and all of a sudden the couch would start to accelerate. Right? If, for example, if there's a force of friction of 25 newtons and there's nothing else going on, the couch is going to start to accelerate, and of course that doesn't make any sense. Right? Why would the couch all of a sudden start moving if you're not even touching it? That's very weird. Right? So if you're not touching it, of course the force of friction is zero newtons. Okay, so let's say now you start pushing on the couch. Let's say you push on the couch with a force of 50 newtons, but the couch isn't moving. So how much is the friction force? Well, if you're not quite sure, the couch isn't moving, right? So the acceleration is zero. That means the net force on the couch is zero. So if you're pushing with 50 newtons, how much should the friction force be? 
hopefully you've convinced yourself it's going to be 50 newtons, right? You're pushing with 50, friction opposes that with 50, the net force is zero, the couch doesn't move because the friction is holding it in place, static, at rest with respect to the ground, the surface underneath. Now, if instead you said to yourself, if you're pushing with 50 newtons, the force of friction is going to be more, let's just think about that. Let's say you're pushing with 50 newtons to the right, but the force of friction is 60 newtons to the left. Well, then what's that couch going to do? Hopefully you realize it's going to start to accelerate towards you. Well, that's real weird. Why would the couch all of a sudden start to accelerate towards you? Maybe that's where, like, ghosts get involved. Ooh, spooky. Right? It doesn't make any sense. There's no way the couch is going to all of a sudden accelerate towards you, right? So if you push with 50 newtons, the force of friction will match that 50 newtons as long as it can and keep the couch in place. All right, so you got to move this couch. Let's say you push now with, with 75 newtons, but the couch is not moving. So how much is the friction force now? Hopefully you said 75 newtons, because again, the friction force is going to match your force one-to-one -to, -one to keep the couch there. This is the static friction force. Let's say finally you push hard enough that you beat the static friction, and now you get the couch moving. But of course now it's moving, so it's not static friction anymore, now it's kinetic friction. Okay, but let's go back to this idea that the static friction force could have this whole range of values. So we're going to put this together with the idea that the friction depends on the properties of the surface and depends on the normal force. And so here's the beginning of the equation. We use the symbol F sub F for force of friction. I purposely left this middle part blank. We'll fill it in, in a second. This symbol here is mu sub S. That's the Greek letter mu. And this is the what's called the coefficient of static friction. It's a property of the material. And N there is, of course, the normal force. Why do they leave a blank in the middle? Because we saw before, before you even touch this, the couch in this case, there's no friction, so it starts at zero. And then as you push harder and harder, the friction force will match your force one to one until you reach some sort of maximum value, which means that this is not an equality, it is an inequality. So we can go ahead and box in the equation. This tells us that the force of friction could be anything from zero up to some maximum value given by the product of mu sub s times N, that's going to be the maximum the static friction force could be, but it could be anything in between as long as the surfaces allow it, and that static friction force will hold the object in place. This mu sub s, again, is what's known as the coefficient of static friction. It's just a number that tells you the relative roughness of the surface. It is a scalar quantity. What units should mu sub s carry to make the equation work? Well, if force of friction is a force in newtons, and normal force is a force in newtons, this coefficient has to be unitless, right? It can't have any units because it has to still maintain the units of newtons. So it's just a pure number. It's a ratio of two forces. And again, it's, it's a property of the material. You can look it up. There are tables uh, published online, or you can figure it out by experiments. The kinetic friction force follows a similar idea. It's still based on the properties of the surfaces and the normal force, but it is an equality not an inequality, and we change mu sub s to mu sub k, the coefficient of kinetic friction. Again, it's a scalar, again, it's, it has no units, and you can look it up. There are tables published, you know, the relative roughness of the surfaces, so you can figure out the mu sub k value for that surface. Now, in your vast experience of moving heavy objects, again, try to imagine moving the couch, which is harder, getting the object going or keeping it going? You probably have the experience that it's harder to get it going than it is to keep it going. Once you get it going, it usually is pretty easy. So if we go back to the idea of how the surfaces lock in, you know, they're, they're locked in and you push and you push and push and eventually you get them to break apart from each other. So now you get it going, but it was hard to get it going. But now that it's moving, the surface on top is sort of bouncing along on top of the surface on the bottom. They don't really have time to lock into place anymore. And so it's usually relatively easier to keep it going than it was to get it going. So in general, for most surfaces, the value of mu sub s, the static coefficient is larger than the value of mu sub k, the kinetic coefficient. Let's put all this together in a graph, because you know we love graphs, right? So here are the equations again, and let's go ahead and draw the axes for the graphs. This will be the force of friction versus the force you are using or something is using to try to move the object. So you go back to visualizing that couch again, and before you touch the couch, how much friction is there? Zero, right? So if you don't apply a force, there's no friction force, so of course our graph will start at zero, zero. When you were pushing with 50 newtons and the couch was not moving, the force of friction was 50 newtons. When you were pushing with 75 newtons, the force of friction was 75 newtons, keeping the couch in place. And so that static friction force is going to match your force one to one up into and including some maximum value. That's what that inequality is. It's 
The force of friction is literally any value from zero up to some largest value given by this product mu sub s times n. We've reached the maximum value static friction could possibly be for this situation. Once you get to that point, and if you're pushing with that force equal to mu sub s times n, friction will still hold it in place because it is an inequality less than or equal to. But if you push just a little bit harder, now you've broken over the static friction force. The friction can't hold it there anymore, and now the object starts moving. But if the object starts moving, now we're not talking about static friction. Now we're talking about kinetic friction. So now we go to this equation over here. And as we just talked about, the value of mu sub k is less than the value of mu sub s. And so the friction force drops down to the value of mu sub k times n. So let's say you keep pushing, but you don't just keep pushing. You actually keep increasing your force. So you keep pushing harder and harder. What's that going to do to the amount of the kinetic friction force? But well, look at the equation. This is not an inequality at all. This is an equality, and there's literally nothing in this equation that has anything to do with how much you're pushing. It's just the properties of the surface and the normal force, which has nothing to do with how much you're pushing as long as you're pushing horizontally, and this is a constant value. So even if you were to push harder and harder, that won't affect the kinetic friction force at all. To finish up this graph, I'm just going to put a dividing line here, show you that this is the static realm when the force of friction was matching your force, keeping it in place. And this is the kinetic friction realm, where you've broken over static friction, and now it drops down to the constant value of the kinetic friction. No matter how hard you push, it'll always be that value.